Hello, welcome to module one, lecture three of the course VLSI design verification and test. In this module, we will take a deeper look into the scheduling of operations within a basic block in high level synthesis. So uh, before going into the scheduling, a bit of a background. How have we come to this uh, place? So firstly, we said that the application will be defined in terms of a high level language, high level hardware description language like Verilog and, uh, uh, and, descri uh, and describing its behavior. Now, after we have obtained this uh, Verilog code, each module of this Verilog code will be parsed and the flow chart from this module will be extracted. Now corresponding to this flow chart, we will be able to obtain a control flow graph of the module. So what will be, what will the control flow graph show? The control flow graph will show how the control flows uh, through various paths um, in the module. So there would be var various mutually exclusive uh, tasks or operations that will be uh, conducted and the control will decide which uh, mutually exclusive sets of operations will be chosen and which will be not based on the based on data input. So now uh, how does a control flow graph look like? A control flow graph, in a control flow graph the nodes are basic blocks as we said before. A basic block is a piece of sequential or straight line code with a single entry point and single exit point. Control cannot uh, come into in the, in the middle of the basic block and control also cannot go out of the basic block in the middle. So control comes at the, f at the beginning of the first statement of the basic block and goes out at the end of the basic block. So uh, and the edges, what, they, uh, what do they denote? They denote the dependency among the basic blocks. Now, uh, we also said that uh, given this control flow graph with basic blocks and their dependencies, I can directly generate the master controller. So what will the master controller control? The master controller will control when will the operations in a basic block be initiated, right? However, um, as we also said before, that the complete master controller cannot be generated at this step because the complete master controller will uh, will be a tool that will uh, that will allow us to ascribe timing information to each operation in a hardware si hardware synthesized circuit. However, until we have not ascribed explicit timing information to each operation within a basic block, we cannot ascribe uh, the complete timing information of the module. So therefore, to obtain the complete master controller, we need to ascribe timing within a basic block, timing to operations within a basic block. And timing to operations within a basic block is done through scheduling. So next, we have now arrived within a basic block and we have to schedule operations within a basic block. Now before going into scheduling, we also said this before uh, that all operations within a basic block can ideally be scheduled in a single clock cycle. However, if we do so, uh, then the, um, there will be unacceptable hardware cost and delays. So why can it, all, how can all operations be done in a single clock cycle? Because there are no mutually exclusive operations within a basic block. All operations are performed. It's simply a data flow graph showing the dependency uh, um, of the data. So data comes in, gets transformed through operations and goes out at the end of the basic block. There are no control operations in it. There are no mutually exclusive operations in it. So however, the length of the clock cycle has to be at least equal to the propagation, the total propagation delay in the critical path. So what do we mean by this? So each of the operations say this one, this one, this one, each of them has a propagation delay because it has to be executed uh, through a resource. And what is a critical path? 
critical path is the is the highest weighted path from the source to sink inside a basic block for example this path has uh, ha has three operations this plus this plus this so this is a critical path now uh, the clock cycle has to be at least big enough so that all three operations can be performed in sequence through this basic block right and uh, therefore uh, uh, because this clock will also feed to other uh, operations other uh, on the through throughout the circuit at different places so this clock cycle although is sufficient for this basic block may cause unnecessary un un unnecessary delay in other basic blocks well let us say uh, in that basic block i have two sequential operations like this and this i don't have the third so therefore it will uh, um, the, it will uh, perform these two operations and wait because the length of the clock cycle is such that three sequential operations can be executed so so uh, the clock cycle length has to be uh, has to be um, judiciously um, decided and adjusted according to the circuit that we have according to the need that we have now the, why did we say all this because uh, then uh, we need to ascribe a timing if we don't do everything in one clock cycle we need to do different operations in different clock cycles so therefore ascribing such operation um, as to to different clock cycles is the very problem of scheduling ascribing the timing information to each operation within a basic block is the problem of scheduling. So what does scheduling do? It assigns a start time to each operation in a basic block. And the, the controller, the, the, it generates, the, it, it allows the generation of the controller so that those operations can be directed at as those time steps within the basic block. <coughs> Now, now choosing a time step for each operation in a basic block is basically an optimization problem as we will see in, de in, in depth uh, in, in the next two classes. The time step is also called a control step or a C step. So scheduling is the task of assigning a time step to each operation in the data flow graph or the operation constraint graph. However, choosing a time step for each uh, operation in general is not a trivial problem. It's, a, it's, a, it's generally an NP complete optimization problem as we will look uh, inside uh, in depth. And depending on uh, the performance uh, of a schedule, the performance or how good the schedule is can be characterized through various attributes. For example, uh, the number of time steps that the schedule took to, um, to, to assign time steps to all operations. So the lower the number of time steps uh, that, uh, within which all operations in the basic block can be scheduled, um, uh, better is it in terms of performance of the circuit, faster will be that circuit. However, in general, to perform uh, in a lower number of time steps requires higher, re uh, higher resources, more resources as we will also see. So the next attribute is how much resources were consumed by the schedule. And uh, other attributes could be how many temporary registers were required, muxes, demuxes, etc. cetera, um, as we will see. So, Depending on mm, uh, the depending on the type of uh, scheduling that we are doing, depending on the um, number of resources that we have, the amount of time that we are taking to schedule, there are principally four different kinds of scheduling problems uh, that are uh, that are there. Literature says uh, there are four different kinds of scheduling problems within a basic block. The first one being resource unconstrained scheduling where we have uh, no constraints on the amount of resources that we can use. 
The second one is time unconstrained scheduling where performance is not uh, an important factor. We can, we want to, we want to take as, um, as low resources uh, as possible and, um, and um, uh, delay is not a matter to us. Uh, so, um, so typically, uh, such circuits uh, or such chips uh, would be, w we would like it them to be very small in size. And that is why we, we want uh, to, uh, to have uh, a critical view on the resource consumed and not so on time. So uh, the next two cases are more generalized scheduling problems, resource constraint scheduling where, um, and time constraint scheduling. We will look at each of them one by one. So before going into the scheduling problem, we will take um, a general example. This running example we will be using throughout uh, the, 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 the uh, topic of scheduling that we will be dealing with. So uh, on, the left, uh, on the left of the screen, we have um, a basic block. So this can be assumed to be the hardware description uh, in, in, in Verilog, a behavioral description of a basic law. So x1 equals to x plus dx, u1 equals to u minus 3x, uh, u minus 3x u dx minus 3y dx. y1 equals to y plus u into dx, and the last one, c equals to x less than a. Now, the corresponding data flow graph of this basic block is shown on the right of this slide. So, uh, see, uh, oper the operation 1 takes as input two independent variables 3 and x. Operation 2 takes two independent variables u and dx. So, uh, uh, operation 3 performs the operation 3 into x into u into dx. And um, operation 6, for example, performs the operation 3 into y. Operation 7 performs the operation 3 into y into dx. And then here, uh, operation 4 performs u minus, 3, uh, um, u minus 3 into x into u into dx. And uh, in 5, we obtain the final u1. Similarly, we obtain the, the uh, y1 and c variables as outputs of 9 and 11 uh, operation, the operation number 9 and operation number 11 respectively. Now, given this data flow graph, we have to obtain the operation constraints graph. So, this the data flow graph that we obtained in the, um, uh, in the last slide is shown on the left hand side of the slide and the corresponding operation constraints graph is shown on the right side. Here, the independent variables have been removed. We have, uh, we have made the graph polar having a single source node and a single sink node and we have only shown the dependencies among the operations, right? So mm, uh, in this way, we have obtained the operations constraint graph. So this operation constraints graph, basically we will be using throughout the topic of scheduling. So the first type of scheduling that we uh, had said was resource unconstrained scheduling. So the definition is, uh, the problem definition is this. Schedule operations within a basic block such that all operations can be performed in correct sequence in minimal time using unlimited hardware resources. So there is no limitation on the hardware resources uh, that we have. Hence the solution approach is to just topologically sort the operations constraint graph that we have and label the nodes in topological order. So this topological order will give me the, uh, no, give me the schedule. Uh, because uh, finally we just have to assign a distinct C step to each level that we have obtained in the uh, after topological ordering of the graph. So such an approach has been adopted in the SHAP algorithm. So it's generated from the DAG or operation constraint graph by a breadth first search from data sources to sinks. So how does it operate? It starts with the highest node that have no parents, the independent nodes in the DAG. So all independent nodes are scheduled in level one and then time steps are assigned in increasing order as we proceed downwards. 
So after we have scheduled the independent operations, a few more nodes become independent and ready for scheduling. And they are scheduled and we perform as many nodes, as many, read, as many ready nodes are there, we, perform, we schedule all the ready nodes that are available at a particular time step to that step. So it follows the simple rule that a successor node can execute only after its parent has executed. So uh, an example, the operation constraint graph that we obtained is shown in the left and on the right we have the corresponding SAP schedule. See that all the independent operations, this, 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 this and this um, have been scheduled in step one and then after these have been scheduled, then three becomes ready, seven becomes ready, nine becomes ready, 11 becomes ready and they are all scheduled in step two. After, uh, after they have been scheduled, after three has been scheduled, four can be scheduled, so four is executed in time step three. 5 can be scheduled after 4 has been scheduled, so 5 has been scheduled in time step 4, right? So mm, we, we will therefore get, get a very fast, per, fast performing um, basic block if we do an ASAP schedule, but obviously we need unlimited hardware. For example, in step 1, we require 4 multiplication operations and if we had a, a multiplier, that, that will perform these oper performing these operations, we need four multipliers because four multiplication operations are being performed, multiplication operations are being performed concurrently in step one. And hence the area of the obtained circuit will be high. Now a similar algorithm is the ALAP algorithm. How is it different from ASAP? ASAP has been obtained from as soon as possible schedule. ALAP on the, uh, corresp ALAP correspondingly uh, has uh, the name as late as possible, right? It works very similar to the ASAP algorithm, except that it starts at the bottom of the DAG and proceeds upwards. ALAP solves the latency constraint problem and the latency bound we can, sh we can give any latency bound um, that is suitable to us. Uh, obviously, we can give the latency bound that has been computed by the SAP algorithm. For example, in the previous SAP schedule, we had obtained a latency bound of four. So, so if we use the same latency bound four and apply it to the LAP algorithm, we will obtain something like this. On the left hand side, again, the operation constraint, the unscheduled operation constraints graph has been shown. On the right side, we obtain the ALAP schedule. So ALAP schedule, as we said, the ASAP schedule starts from the source towards the sink. ALAP schedule progresses from the sink towards the source. So the, N, the NOP has been scheduled, at the start of the NOP operation is at time step five. So all, um, um, all, op all operations on which NOP depends can be scheduled in the previous time step at time step four. So NOP, NOP depends on operations five, nine and 11. So these three operations have been scheduled in time step four. At time step three, all, opera all operations on which five, nine, 11 depends can be scheduled. So four, eight and 10 has been scheduled in time step three. In time step two, three and seven has been scheduled similarly and in time step one, one, two and six has been scheduled. So this is what is the ALAP algorithm. Now from the ASAP and ALAP algorithm, uh, a few very important concepts can be, can be obtained and these concepts are applied in the more generalized scheduling problems that we will, we will take up in, in, in due course in the next few slides. So uh, mobility is defined for each operation. What is mobility? Mobility is the difference between the ALAP time and the ASAP time of a schedule. And what does it provide? This difference between ALAP and ASAP provides a, a measure of, this, of the slack that is available on the start time. So 
this mobility, this term mobility is also called the degree of freedom of an operation node because it defines the number of cycles by which an operation can be moved upwards or downwards in the schedule. So, uh, taking an example in the same operation constraints graph that we have, we see that those in the red lines, the, the red line in the right side here, this one represents the critical path because all nodes in this path has zero mobility. Hence, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 all have zero mobility. Operation, see now that operation 6 and 7 has mobility 1. Why? Operation 6 can be scheduled in either time step 1 or time step 2. Similarly, operation 7 can either be scheduled in time step 2 or time step 3 with the latency bound of 4 that we have. So, the mobility of the operation 6 and 7 becomes 1. Similarly, the 4 operations 8, 9, 10, 11 has a mobility of 2. Why? Because uh, it is easy to see 8 can be scheduled in operation uh, in time step 1, 2 or 3, 9 can correspondingly be scheduled in time steps 2, 3 or 4, 10 can be scheduled in time steps either in 1, 2 or 3 and 11 similarly can be scheduled in time steps 2, 3 or 4. Okay. Uh, so, with this concept we now move into time unconstrained scheduling. From resource unconstrained scheduling, now we move to time unconstrained scheduling. So, what is the problem definition of uh, this uh, scheduling? Schedule operations within a basic block such that all operations can be performed in correct sequence using minimal hardware resources in unlimited time. So, as we said, we now have unlimited time, there is no bound on performance, performance can be as bad as possible. However, we need to consume as low amount of resource as is possible. So, how do you do that? Perform a serialized topological sorting of the DAG and assign a C step to each operation so that op optimal scheduling may be performed. Right? So, uh, we will not uh, look into this scheduling as this we um, uh, it is easy to understand what we do here, we just perform a serialized topological sort and uh, schedule the DAG and uh, therefore, we will not look at this anymore. Now, we move into the more generalized scheduling strategies. So, uh, the first one here is resource constraint scheduling. So, what is the definition of the problem? Schedule all operations within a basic block such that they can be performed in correct sequence in minimal time given the available numbers and types of resources. So, now we have a constraint on the total amount of resources that we can use. Now, given this constraint on the availability of resources, we have to perform all the operations in the basic block in minimum time. Right? So, we want to maximize performance given an area constraint or a resource constraint on the circuit. So, uh, moving on, uh, moving on, in this type of scheduling, we will be given this operation constraints graph and we will have a different symbols to represent a few things. Firstly, n represents the number of operations in the operation constraints graph, the total number of operations that are there. n r represents the number of resource types available. a k equals to the upper bound on the number of resources of type k. So, Suppose, uh, you have both multiplication and addition operations within a, in an arbitrary or uh, basic block. Right? Now, uh, additions must be performed using a separate adder uh, fun uh, functional unit or resource and uh, multiplications will be performed by a multiplier resource. Now, let us say we have three multiplier resources and four adders. So, 
a k where a multiplier will be 4 because we have 4 multipliers and let us say 3 adders. So, a adder will be 3 because we have 3 adders and n r will be 2 because we have 2 types of resources one is adder and one is multiplier. T i will represent the start time of each operation v i. So, the operation constraints graph is represented by g equals to v comma e, the, op the nodes being defined as v i and the start time of a node will be defined as T i. T i s is the ASAP time of v i. So, when we have done the ASAP schedule, we have we have labeled each operation with its ASAP time, its ASAP schedule time. So, that ASAP schedule time will be designated as T i s. Similarly, T i l will designate the ALAP time of operation. So, there is a mistake here, uh, it, is, it is represented as ASAP, but it will be ALAP, ALAP time of operation V i. And D i denotes the propagation delay corresponding to operation V i. So, the propagation delay will mean how much time it takes to perform let us say an addition on the adder circuit on the adder resource that we have that is the propagation delay d i. Now, given these um, uh, notations we will look at how difficult uh, this uh, problem of scheduling is. For example, we can we actually have polynomial time optimal solutions in in in, in a very stringent few cases. For example, only when the number of types of resources are just one, we have all addition operations within the whole basic block within the within the within the full DAG. All operations take the same delay or same propagation delay, all operations have the same propagation delay, unit propagation delay and the DAG is basically a tree and is, is not a DAG as such. For example, how does, when does a DAG become a tree? When removing the direction constraint of the DAG, even after removing the direction constraint of the DAG, there is no cycle in the DAG, then the DAG becomes a tree. So, it has been shown that if we have these constraints, then a polynomial time solution or a linear time solution can be obtained um, can be obtained for such an operation constraints graph and that is basically obtained through the Hughes algorithm. However, if the DAG is generalized, I have not written down here, if the DAG is generalized, then we can have at most two resources. We, we can have at most two resources in a generalized DAG of one type and then only we can obtain polynomial time solutions. More than two resources, three, four, five, but a constrained number of resources, we do not know, we still do not know whether we get a polynomial time solution or not. So, basically what we take in general is that the solution is NP complete if the number of resources is greater than two and we have a generalized DAG. So, the problem is as complicated as this. So, hence um, if the problem is complicated and which means that the problem is NP complete, then we have different types of uh, strategies to solve it. We, um, uh, the optimal solution, optimal solutions can be op obtained uh, by various mechanisms for e example, we can formulate the whole problem as an uh, as a linear program as an ILP and uh, then we have uh, um, solving tools ILP solving tools to to solve such ILPs and get the solution. We can apply uh, advanced state space search uh, techniques such as depth first branch and bound and best first branch and bound to exhaustively but uh, systematically uh, search the whole state space and find out an optimal solution where the state space uh, would mean uh, the all the different possibilities uh, for assigning operations at different time steps to different resources 
resources and uh, by exhaustively searching through all the possibilities find the best solution that we get. However, um, and why we said that uh, even if it is ex even though it is exhaustive the by ad by systematically searching uh, the whole uh, state space we can prune or cut off some parts of the state space and get away by not searching them because uh, uh, by through such systematic technique we can ensure that that portion of the state space will never contain the optimal solution we will look at these optimal solutions in a bit more detail um, in the next lecture now, uh, um, along with optimal solutions, optimal solutions for huge circuits that uh, we often have um, in VLSI domain is not always possible. We, it is not always possible to apply uh, optimal algorithms because it may take years to, um, uh, to give, a, give a solution. It may take even years, literally. So, uh, we also have heuristic fast um, uh, solutions where um, uh, where uh, the entire state space is obviously not searched and hence the solutions are uh, um, are on most cases are suboptimal however um, the solutions often produced are quite good with respect to the best solution that we can get and the advantage is that we often get the solution in very quick time so heuristic fast solutions are useful when the overhead for optimal solution is unacceptable and good heuristics often produce near optimal solutions in many cases. The other approach is the stochastic solution approach. The stochastic solution approach, uh, we, in this approach we start with an initial solution. So, a very um, um, crude heuristic fast solution could provide us this in uh, this first uh, in first randomly generated candidate solution and from this solution we refine this solution through several iterations and and moving through different um, different areas of the state space and obtaining a solution. So, uh, it will obviously again uh, not always give a, uh, uh, an optimal solution but uh, in many cases uh, the solutions are often um, uh, acceptable and good. With this we come to the end of module 1 of lecture 3.